from the bonding standpoint, um, and again, you've you've issued bonds before. Basically, what you're doing it's it's just like a mortgage. You're you're um, borrowing money, and you're promising who's ever um, investing in your bonds that you are going to pay those that money back over uh, a period of time. Usually, you're doing these bonding projects. They're usually expensive. They're, a lot of times, it's for your infrastructure. Is when you're going to use the, the bond financing, long-term paybacks. You know, t 20 to 30 years. There's um, generally two, two types of bonds. One is called general obligation bonds, and this is where the full faith and credit of the municipality is backing those bonds, okay? The revenue bonds, we see this occasionally. Um, there's a certain revenue stream that is backing the bonds. So it's not the full faith and credit of the town, but a specific revenue stream. So a parking garage is an example. The city of Manchester built a very expensive parking garage, but it was going to be those parking fees that were going to pay back the bond that they uh, took out to build that parking garage. So um, in most cases, probably most of your bonds, I would imagine, are general obligation bonds. With the bonding, there's a separate chapter. It's RSA Chapter 33. You, the most important thing is you have to dot every I and cross every T and follow that law to a T. And as Steve indicated, DRA can disallow it, but long before DRA would get around to disallowing a bond article because you didn't dot your I's and cross your T's, you, would, you will not be able to get bond council approval to issue those bonds. So more important than DRA is bond council. So you do have to um, follow um, exactly what the law says. Um, the interesting part of the bond issue is if you do it right, you dot your I's, you cross your T's, you bring it to town meeting, and they approve it, um, you're going to have a series of payments, debt service payments, that you're going to have to pay back over a certain number of years, 10, 15, 20 years, whatever. If a future town meeting neglects or refuses to appropriate that money to pay back that debt service, there's a statute that says DRA can insert that payment and cause you to raise it in your tax rate. That is one of the rare occasions where a non-appropriated amount is going to be included in your tax rate whether or not the voters um, approve that. The reason being is we as a state cannot have a municipality default on a bond payment. One municipality defaulting on a bond, pay on a bond payment would have ramifications for the entire state uh, including the state of New Hampshire's bond rating and everyone else's. So there are protections in the law to make sure that every municipality, every school district, every county, the state of New Hampshire that issues bonds will honor those obligations to their investors because there's just too much at stake if, if there's a default. Um, so that is one of, that's called one of those mandatory assessments. And again, credit rating implications. Um, Obviously, you know, with a default, we would ha certainly have those credit rating um, Im impacts. Um, for the bonds, again, Chapter 33 is um, kind of pretty specific as, as to what you can use it for. And again, as I said, it's pretty much for those high-cost infrastructure, capital improvement type things. One thing the law does say is that you are prohibited from issuing bonds to cover current maintenance and operation costs unless otherwise authorized by law. So basically what that's saying is you can't put your grocery bill on your credit card. That's what it's saying. You can't put your monthly mortgage on your credit card. You can take out the mortgage and you've got to pay it back, but then you can't put that on your credit card is what it's saying. Now, I can tell you um, there have been a couple of exceptions to that where um, there were municipalities that got themselves into, or at least one, that got themselves into a situation where they were in a facing a significant, um, a s significant deficit because of an embezzlement, a very significant deficit because of an embezzlement and mismanagement of town funds by the town manager. And they were in such a deficit that they, they could not raise that money enough in one year to get them out of it. And they had to go to the legislature and ask permission to borrow money, pay it back over a five-year period to get them back on track. Okay, so that's why it says unless otherwise authorized by law. So there could be some exceptions, but generally you can't be you can't be bonding your operating costs. 
You would not want to do that anyway, right? Um, but in terms of the philosophy behind doing doing bonding, and I know there was one town which I was so surprised. <laughs> You know, it was a few years ago. They said, oh, we never bond. We don't believe in bonding. We just pay for everything right up front. I thought, well, that, you know, that sounds really good not to have any debt. But the whole purpose of bonding, again, because it's, it's these assets that you are expecting to last a really long time. So it's not something that you're going to just use in two or three or four years. These are assets like your water system, your sewer system, your 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 new building, whatever. You expect it to be here 10, 15, or 20 years. So part of what you're doing is that you're, you're structuring the payments for this over the life of the assets so that you're not taxing just today's taxpayers for an asset that is going to benefit the citizens 10 years or 15 or 20 years from now. So certainly if you were to just try to, you know, just put it all in the tax rate right now, that would be huge sticker shock for some of these. But if you're spreading those payments out, it's referred to as intergenerational tax equity. So you're kind of spreading that out. So you're saying, yes, this fire truck is going to benefit us for 10 years. There's no reason today's taxpayers have to pay for the whole thing. And um, usually when you're doing these large capital projects, it's not just one or the other type of financing. Often you'll be putting money in the capital reserve fund to help lower lower the cost of, it, of the, the item or the project. You may be combining it with um, bonding. There may be a grant. And that's where we get into that, that gross basis of accounting, uh, uh, gross basis budgeting in terms of putting the Warren article. So you will often see that it's a large costly project, but you've got money in a reserve fund, maybe you have some grant money that's available, and then you've got some bonding. Uh, so it's, it can be multiple financing options for that. Um, there is a limit. Um, again, part of that, those statutes that help protect uh, municipalities, protect the state, there's a debt limit. Uh, it's 3% of your equalized property value that's determined by DRA that's on their website. You're probably nowhere close to it. I wouldn't imagine that you would be close to your debt limit, but it's just good to know that there is a, a limit out there. Many municipalities have their own um, policy in place that sets something more restrictive. They, you can certainly have a policy, excuse me, more restrictive than what the statute requires. Uh, for example, Dover is 65% of whatever the state limit is. So they, they are being more conservative. Um, Concord has an, another policy. I don't know if, um, if Hampton has your own debt, debt policy or not, um, but that is an uh, option that the, uh, usually in, um, it's adopted by the governing body um, in terms of when do, you, when do you expect projects to be financed through bonds? When do you expect projects to be financed maybe solely through those savings accounts? When do you expect it to be part of the operating budget? And some um, municipalities have different thresholds to give department heads ideas, uh, you know, kind of direction as to what is expected and have some consistency. Okay? Um, and then certainly, you know, where do you, where do you go to issue these bonds? Um, some municipalities, they issue the bonds directly to Wall Street. You know, usually most of the larger communities do that. Um, most communities will go through the New Hampshire Municipal Bond Bank, which takes all those bond issues that have been approved, for example, in March meeting by schools and towns and village districts. They kind of package it all together, and then they go sell those bonds from the bond bank uh, down on Wall Street. So it, it saves you a lot of costs and a lot of... Um, terms of uh, attorney fees and all those kinds of things by going through the municipal bond bank. So that's probably where you're going for smaller projects. You can certainly go to your local banks. You'll, um, chapter 33 refers to bonds or notes. So if you had a project that you want to pay off over three years, maybe it's a you know four million dollar project, and you may just you know your local bank may say, hey, you know we'll finance that for you through a note. So that's another option for water and sewer projects. There is the state revolving loan fund through the Department of Environmental Services, which um, has some very favorable interest rates for municipalities. So often um, that's where most of that financing can go through. 